Okay, we are now recording, and I haven't said anything at all previous to beginning the recording. <laughs> anyway, um, inverse, er, the only reason we use parsers is that we inherited them from the 1960s and 70s when we were just getting started with simple, uh, uh, you know, simple programming. And a parser itself was hard enough to do. So uh, here's Barry. So we could, um, um, we had to use parsers. They were the, they were all we could do. But then we just got stuck with them. It's kind of like you get used to it. Uh, you know, like if you, if you buy a pair of shoes and one of them pinches your toes, after a while you get used to it and you don't ever bother getting new shoes. Uh, and that's sort of what happened to us. We just kept on using the same old parser technology. Very bad idea. Anyway, so yes, I believe very strongly that inverse parsers are much superior. Uh, let's see. Okay, now I can get back to uh, Barry's questions. I deferred, Barry, I deferred answering your questions until you got here. Uh, it seems the primary utility of Sappho and its unique functions is giving a designer who's not well-versed in programming the ability to create a world in one's own system. But if we're making a game ourselves, is there any reason to use these ideas or are they specifically for sharing our system with artists who are not programmers? The primary motivation behind Sappho is to make this kind of stuff more accessible to, uh, to non-programmers. That it, uh, I've always felt <laughs> programmers are made, but artists are born. Uh, which is not really true, but it is easier for an artist to learn programming than for a programmer to learn art. Actually, you don't learn it. Um, and so I've always felt that we would do better if we could get more artists into the mix. Uh, so I felt it important to bend over backwards to make it easy for them. However, it's also true, I mean, when I do this for myself, uh, sure, I can write up all the code in Java, JavaScript, whatever. Um, but I found that uh, the system I'm using, not just Sappho, but the system as a whole, is a lot easier than doing everything in raw code because basically it takes a lot of the standard ideas that you use over and over and over and it boils them down into simple constructs that are much easier to implement. So when I work with the technology, I just, I just use the, the stuff I've built rather than trying to hard code it because, uh, uh, you know, with, with the programming language, you're working at a lower level. Uh, and so, you know, if you really want to get in there programming, why not code in machine language? You know, that really gives you power. So, you know, there are hierarchies of programming. At the very bottom is machine code, uh, you know, hexadecimal digits. And then a tiny step up from that is assembler. And then a step above that is C. And then a step above that is C++. And then at that point, you branch out into a million languages, some of which are lower level and some of which are higher level, for example, JavaScript is at a somewhat higher level than Java. Um, uh, Python is fairly high level. And the basic idea is the higher level languages have less power, but e you can get more done with fewer lines of code. So that's the whole concept of hierarchy of programming languages. And in fact, there's such a thing, <laughs> you can go way up high and you can get into scripting languages. You know, a lot of Excel has a scripting language. A lot of these programs have their own little programming languages built into them. Those are extremely high level. You know, you can't, there are a lot of things that you can't do in these scripting languages. Uh, there was a wonderful high level scripting language way back Apple did it. It was uh, called HyperTalk, 
and it went in with something called HyperCard, which was a very interesting experiment in trying to make more programming power available to a larger group of people. And I've always thought it was an excellent idea. And unfortunately, it kind of died out. Um, and we really have nothing equivalent to it now. Uh, nothing as clean and simple as HyperCard. Uh, right now, if you've got a really raw beginner, uh, you know, they can mess around in, in HTML, but that's not really a programming language. That's just putting images on a screen and accepting input. There really isn't much in the way of coding, of data crunching in that. So uh, I think in many ways, we, our situation today is not as good as it used to be. Um, about the best they've got is HTML plus JavaScript. JavaScript is not that easy to use for, for a raw beginner. Uh, let's see, I'm a bit confused why Cboot's menu system doesn't count as a graphical user interface. What differentiates it as a linguistic one? Yes, uh, technically the, uh, uh, the Cboot, the menu system, the inverse parser system really is just an extension of graphical user interface. But it's kind of like the idea of a hierarchy of programming languages. It's a higher level of uh, user interface. It is uh, not as powerful as the GUI, but it is also easier to use. And this is a big point. I'm working on a video right now. And the big point I'm trying to make here is that a linguistic user interface ultimately has more expressive capability, even though it isn't as directly powerful as a GUI. Let me, let me see if I can explain that point. You can do more verbs in a linguistic user interface than you can with a Louis. Here's, here's how I'll explain it. Um, every user, in it, well, there are only three user interfaces, command line, GUI, and Louis. And the command line interface, you know, you just type in the little code, CD slash REM5 slash colon, blah, blah, blah. Um, and that only worked because there were very few verbs. And in fact, uh, as the various like Unix, um, as it expanded, it got harder and harder to use. It was easy when there were only about uh, two dozen verbs in the system, uh, so like the simple DOS systems used command line interfaces. And you could have only a few dozen verbs in them and they were e easy to use because you could memorize them all. However, um, once people started wanting more power and more capability, we added more verbs and that meant you had to memorize more acronyms and uh, even worse, we started adding all of these additional parameters, you know, so you could say, uh, LD slash RM1 slash TD slash, you know, sticking all these extra little specifiers onto it. And uh, God, it was hell. Um, and you had to be a Linux uh, uh, wizard to properly utilize it. And so a rough rule of thumb is that command line interfaces were only good up to about two dozen verbs. They could handle an infinite number of verbs, but humans couldn't. And so for all practical purposes, most command line interfaces stopped at about two dozen verbs. Um, okay, then the GUI came along and uh, it turns out that, well, I'll just have to explain about 20 years ago, I did an experiment, or not, a, I did some measurements. At that time, there was a problem 
that should a program serve the professionals or should it serve the beginners? There were still a lot of people who were not at all computer literate. And so the market was really divided and we didn't know. Microsoft tried to cater to both worlds with Microsoft Word where they had a simple version. You could, it started off in the amateur version and then there was a hidden, there was a menu item tucked away somewhere that said, go to the professional version. And you selected that and whoosh, all of a sudden all the new icons and menus appeared. Uh, that didn't work. Uh, so at that time, this actually throughout the 90s, this problem continued. Um, at that time, the solution was to have two versions. And typically, different companies did the different versions. There was the amateur version and the professional version. Uh, and we saw this over and over. For example, Apple had a project, a product called Apple Works. And it had a simple word processor, a simple spreadsheet, a simple database manager, a simple draw program. Um, meanwhile, Microsoft had Microsoft Word, the ultimate professional, and you could do anything with it. And so you had the Apple word processor for amateurs and Word for professionals. And then with, uh, uh, paint programs. We had lots of simple paint programs so the kids could draw squiggly lines in different colors. And then we had Adobe Illustrator, super duper paint program. Um, spreadsheets, there were a variety of simple spreadsheets, but then there was Microsoft Excel. Um, uh, photo manipulation program, same story. Uh, web uh, website editors. Uh, the leading there one there was Mac, uh, uh, Macromedia Dreamweaver, which was then later acquired, um, which was the professionals. But then Apple made a really nice one. I don't remember the name of it, but they had a beautiful little web. It was pure WYSIWYG. What you see was definitely what you got. You just edited the web page right there. And it was great. I used it for a number of years, but then uh, with HTML4, it all became obsolete and they had to dump it. So anyway, we had this system all through of the professional version and the amateur version. Well, I went through counting verbs in the amateur versions of these various genres of applications. And I found that they all had uh, an average of about 100 verbs to them. Uh, that was apparently some sort of standard. Or nobody ever actually declared it. But in practice, when they were trying to keep it down to the minimum necessary that worked well in a GUI, it was about 100 verbs. The professional, <laughs> the professional ones had so many verbs. I once gave a class of mine a challenge for homework. Count how many verbs there are in Microsoft Word. And uh, nobody came, no two students came up with the same answer. <laughs> it was, there were so many, they, they couldn't count, they, they kept miss, missing some, but they averaged about 300. And I got similar numbers. Oh God, there was one of them that was 400 verbs. I can't remember which one. But 300 was the rough average for the professional programs. Now, those two numbers, 100 verbs and 300 verbs, they tell us something very important. They tell us, the 300 tells us, this is the ceiling. If you go above this, your program is unusable. Nobody can figure out how to use it. So a GUI has a, has a ceiling of about 300 verbs, whereas the command line interface has a ceiling of maybe a couple dozen verbs. And the GUI is very easy to use up to about 100 verbs. So 100 verbs is the floor for a GUI, and 300 is the ceiling. Well, that, that tells us a great deal. However, it also 
it also tells us that we've got a, a ceiling over our heads, that GUIs don't go far enough. And we need something better because in fact, we've been stuck with that 300 verb ceiling for 20 some odd years now and longer. So, uh, you know, we definitely need something new and better. And I believe that a linguistic uh, user interface can go to a lot more than 300 verbs. So anyway, that's my reasoning there. Uh, let's see. Uh, okay. Uh, Ajmal has some questions here. What motivation does the player have to do things like gossip about other uh, characters or speak coldly towards characters? Some players might choose to play a role or act dramatically, but I feel like when faced with a dialogue menu, a lot of people might just choose to be as good as possible most of the time to come out on top. Do you design the systems in a way that encourages the player to take part in exaggerated character uh, drama? Well, yeah, if you're a good artist, uh, sure you can, I mean, <laughs> uh, you can, it, it's how you design your story world that, uh, that makes this work. Uh, and in fact, the, <laughs> Fact is, you cannot dramatically interact with people without at some point doing something unpleasant. Because you get caught up, you know, somebody asks you, did your best friend cheat on the test? Okay, now you got a choice. You can betray your best friend or you can tell a lie. Those are your only two choices. Well, you could refuse to answer, but no matter what, you're gonna hurt somebody. So in fact, most good drama is about this. This is the thing that bothers me about uh, what I'll call comic book stories. Comic book stories, including comic book movies, are for children and they have very simple moral lessons. There's a bad guy and a good guy and the good guy has to do the good things to defeat the bad guy, which is fine for kids. But adult, literature, adult storytelling, is about the fact that in the real world, you get caught in moral dilemmas where there is no truly virtuous solution. You've got to hurt somebody, no matter what. And uh, uh, by the way, this is something that young people especially have a real problem with uh, because they haven't been caught up in dilemmas like this. And so they're still thinking we can always do the right thing. And then they get mad when, you know, society, you know, has things that are bad. Uh, you know, right now in the United States, there are people dying because they're not getting adequate health care. Well, yeah, that's wrong. That's bad. Unfortunately, changing the health care system to make sure that gets fixed is a huge job. We can't just, you know, say we're going to universal health care tomorrow. That's where we need to get, but it's going to take us years to transform the system. Uh, I mean, it's, it's <laughs> health care has to operate 24-7, 365. That is, you can't say, all right, everybody's insurance policies are shut down and the government will now build a new system and we'll have it up and running in a few years. Uh, in the meantime, don't get sick. Uh, we can't do that. So uh, we're stuck with this awful system. Uh, there are all sorts of moral dilemmas you face like this. And anyway, good literature is about the moral dilemmas. Good storytelling and in fact, a good interactive story world will put you in those moral dilemmas. Um, you know, how do you get along with a group of people when there are always people who dislike each other? How do you deal with the fact that Joe hates Mary and you wanna be friends with Joe and you wanna be friends with Mary? So, you know, what are you gonna do? Barry, you got a question? Specifically, um... I, obviously, there's ways to do this, but 
could you give like an example of how you would motivate the player to enter one of those moral dilemmas? Because like, I, like you could just like thrust them into it, but h- how do you get them to a point where they like, they feel the need to confront it and aren't sure how to do that instead of like, like, so they're not just experimenting and clicking verbs, but like, how, how do you, how do you give them an objective where it's clear that they have to make a choice and it matters to them? Well, that's, that shouldn't be difficult. Uh, I'm going to have a party. I'm going to invite uh, lots of people to my party, all the people I like. So I'll invite Joe and I'll invite Mary. And then somebody says, and, and then they come to the party and they start screaming at each other in the middle of my party. What am I going to do now? Do I throw one of them out? Do I try to pacify them? Uh, if, they, if they're irreconcilable, well, do I favor one over the other? Uh, nobody ever asks to get put into these moral dilemmas. They get crammed down your throat. That's what makes them tragic. And that's what makes being an adult so difficult because you do have to make these hard choices. I've had to make a lot of these. (laughs) I'll tell you one. Uh, while I was at Atari, I had an employee who was really screwing up. He he just wasn't doing the job. And uh, I went through all the, you know, all the proper managerial things to get him on the right track and get him moving and motivated and so forth. But he just, he just kept screwing up. And finally, I, and I'd been discussing his case with my boss for several months and the boss had suggested things and Anyway, finally, the boss said, look, you've done everything you can. you got to fire him. Well, I didn't want to fire the guy. He was a nice guy. I liked him. But my boss was right. The guy was screwing up. I had to fire him. I still remember I almost broke down crying when I fired him. You know, I brought him in and had a long talk with him and then said, you know, the boss says you got to go. and and." I was terribly upset. It was a real moral dilemma for me, but I did it because I knew I had to. So this is the kind of thing that gets forced on you. Um, so Barry. So it, um, again, that, that is that last bit that like, it, like, so in, in your everyday life, like you had to do that because otherwise you'd lose your job and then you wouldn't make any money. And yeah, like, yeah. yeah. So, so, I mean, there's probably a lot of answers to this, but like, wh- how, what is the, um, what external motivating factors can you give to the player so they're not just messing around, but they are like an active participant with goals in the story? Like what, what kind of objectives can you give them? I would not impose strong goals. That is, I would not say you have to save the princess or become president or something like that. I would just throw them into the situation. Uh, That's what I'm doing with the Arthurian story world I'm building. You just start off, you're King Arthur, and it's not telling you (laughs) what to do. You just have these experiences, and a lot of them can be a little difficult. Um, And you just have to make the decisions as best you can. Now it turns out uh, there's there is a uh, uh, the way the story world is rigged. You go through all of these decisions, which really are ways of expressing how good you are as a leader, and they will ultimately affect ev- different pe- everybody's attitudes towards you. And late in the story world. Your, your evil son, Mordred, will declare a revolt. Say, you know, the old man can't hack it anymore. I'm taken over as the new king. Who's with me? And people will t- choose up sides based on their loyalty to you. If, they th- if you've uh, antagonized them, if they think you're a weak ruler or a bad ruler or an evil ruler, they'll go over to Mordred's side. And then there will be a big battle. And if uh, too many people went to Mordred, you die. 
So the dilemma is forced on you by dramatic circumstances. And you know, if you read almost any, any good tragedy, and in fact, an awful lot of comedies, uh, there are lots of these situations where there are dilemmas. So uh, next question, you write, this word represents how confident, <clears throat> how confident she is of her assessment. Perhaps she doesn't want to make too firm a statement if it comes back to her later. What if it does come back to her later, but with a small incorrect detail? For example, instead of <clears throat> Camigdo is fairly certain of this, it comes back as very certain. Can the player character correct the record? Do they have to deny it and make a correction? What if the player accidentally misquotes a detail? Uh, is that seen as a completely fabricated lie or can the characters recognize when a quote or an event is close enough to the real event? Uh, actually, I'll warn you, this was something I had in C-Boot that, uh, that I think may have gone too far. And it was one of the reasons why I felt that I needed to abandon C-Boot. The idea was people could make statements about each other's traits, say, well, he's a really good guy, but I'm not really very sure. Um, as opposed to, oh God, I know this guy inside and out, he's really good. Uh, so you could state a degree of certainty. Um, if you stated more, if you express more certainty, that would engender more trust in the person you're talking to. If they, boy, he's really, he's going out on a limb. He's asserting this certainly. He's sure of himself. I can trust him. Whereas if he says, well, you know, I think he's kind of good, but I don't really know then you're not giving much information to the other person. They're not gonna rely on you as much or trust you as much. So adding certainty is a good way of engendering trust. But if you're wrong, then, uh, and they find out, then you lose a lot more trust. So it was meant to be a, another dilemma you faced. And then the question would be, well, what are the odds, if I'm going to lie about it, what are the uh, odds that the person will find out the truth? It all turned out to be way too complicated. And so in all honesty, I think it best not to include the uncertainty adverb. So uh, let me now get to some of the questions here. I have to say, I played a few parser games that were very good actually taking advantage of the parse, parser system. Counterfeit Monkey by Emily. Uh, but yeah, most of those games are kind of frustrating because of the way the parser is handled. Mist was first made in HyperCard. Yes, yes it was. And uh, unfortunately it was a little too slow and clumsy and so they had to, uh, uh, they had to write their own. Basically what they wrote was a souped up HyperCard that was customized for the particular technical requirements they had. Um, so uh, let's see the, uh, I don't know, where am I? Here we are. Um, wait, no. Uh, so let's actually talk about the, uh, the lessons, uh, starting with Sappho. Um, there we go. Uh, I, perhaps you may have noticed, but yes, I am uh, kind of proud of Sappho. Uh, it went through many years of development. Um, uh, and, uh, I'm, I think it is an excellent language for beginners. And in all honesty, I mean, I use it and I find, and of course, I know it, I wrote it. Uh, so it's easy for me. And yes, it is difficult at first because it is so odd. Um, but uh, it has all sorts of characteristics. I especially like the fact no syntax errors, period. Uh, because let's face it, syntax errors are the bane of your existence as a programmer. You're always fighting. Now, fortunately, a lot of development systems now have an automatic syntax error checking, 
And so they make it much easier to avoid those things. Nevertheless, there's still lots of what I'll call semi-syntax errors where it gets past the uh, checker and screws up the program. And that just cannot happen in, uh, in Sappho. Uh, another thing Sappho does that would be impossible in any other programming language, it's only possible because this is because of the technology of the story world, uh, and that is the concept of poison as opposed to uh, error. Uh, you know, from time immemorial, programmers have, have suffered from an error that in effect destroys the program, whereas with a runtime error, whereas with this technology in Sappho, it doesn't hurt at all. It just says, all right, this option is poison. We'll do another option. Um, it's a very nice system. It actually took a lot of work to build that system and make it work smoothly, but uh, it really helps. And you, you, can, uh, uh, you can find out that something was poisoned. It, it, it tells you uh, in, there's a, in effect a debugging window that tells you that there was poison. And then the other thing I am really proud of is the scriptalizer, which allows you to mess with those algorithms. There's no other programming language in the world that I know of that allows you to fiddle around with the algorithms and see how they change under variations. And I think that is enormously valuable especially when you're dealing with bounded numbers that, uh, you know, it's a little hard to understand what they're doing. So anyway, uh, I would urge you that when you, you know, if you build a system, a technology, that you will probably be best if it's a highly specialized, the more specialized it is, the more you need its own custom scripting language. And that takes advantage of the customized elements. And so the, if you do create a scripting language, uh, something like the Sappho system, there are a lot of good ideas. The very least is the use of color. I, it, for many years, we had color in, in our computers by 1990 and lots of color by 2000, by 2000, everything had at least 16 bit color. And we were already well on the way to 24 bit color uh, by the year 2000 with big screens. And we should have just instantly moved over to full color usage in uh, programming languages and we didn't. Today, we now have some, a limited use of color uh, that I find rather limp-wristed, uh, just not very substantial, whereas the Sappho language relies on color. And I think that's an important uh, feature that definitely deserves to be uh, emulated. Um, this next lesson, uh, well, any questions about, about Sappho? Oh, wait, I've missed something. Uh, Seaboot had a really nice cosmetic interface from the screenshots you showed. Is that something you felt was important? And do you still, uh, do you still? For real, those characters looked wonderful. Uh, actually, this is one place where I had, where I exercised some really good judgment. I knew, that I am not an artist capable of drawing or painting or anything like that. And so I recruited a couple of very good artists. Uh, one guy, uh, uh, was he? No, he's in Brazil, I believe. And uh, uh, he was the one who did most of the artwork. Then there was another fellow in France who design most of the icons used in the system. And uh, those guys did great work. I still feel really guilty 
that I had to abandon Seaboot after those guys had done such glorious work. Um, but uh, yeah, that that is a place where you can uh, delegate effort uh, to other people. Uh, it is not. Um, you know, the design of the story world still has to take place in one mind and cannot readily be delegated. But the, uh, um, the artwork is easily delegated. So let's see. Uh, yeah, they did great work. I feel like maybe it would be a good idea to build a very simple game, like very, very simple, using your system, maybe on a course, so that everybody can see how it actually works and everything. Because we may understand the principles of your system, but at the same time, it's still very hard to have a real understanding of how a game is actually made with your system. And in fact, we will be doing that, but not with the full technology. The SWAT system is just too big, <clears throat> too hairy, and uh, it would just take too long to drag you guys through that. I mean, for me personally, it would be great to have a whole bunch of people who know how to use the system and start building stuff with it. But uh, I feel I have a moral obligation to encourage, you know, creative variation. And that'll be harder if you commit to one technology. However, the encounter system, I will uh, present to you in a later lesson. I still haven't written up that lesson, but the encounter system is much simpler, much easier to learn, and uh, I will be presenting it to you a little later. Um, basically, when we reach, it'll be when we reach the end of the list of lessons that's currently there. And uh, uh, I'll walk you through my uh, the the uh, Le Mort d'Artur uh, story world that's built using the encounter system, and I'll show you how it's done. And um, then turn you guys loose. You can play with it. It won't be hard for you to build things. So, and then later on, if you uh, if you're still interested in the full-blown technology, uh, you can contact me. I'll, I'll just uh, I'll just send you the, the software in Java. You're welcome to it. In fact, I think you can download it somewhere, but uh, um, I don't want to push that on you. Uh, so any other questions about Sappho? Okay, let's move on to deep toe. <coughs> I wanted to completely rewrite this lesson, <coughs> but I just couldn't see a good way to rewrite it. Um, <coughs> uh, basically, I start off pointing out, we gotta use linguistic user interfaces, but, but alas, alack, we cannot do natural language. And uh, there's no way that we're going to have natural languages working, certainly not in my language, in my lifetime, and probably not in yours, because natural language requires <clears throat> a deep understanding of human reality. For example, <clears throat> consider the following. Uh, following short paragraph um, from an obviously feasible <clears throat> uh, story world. Uh, I left for a business trip and sat at the airport for hours and they canceled my flight at two in the morning. So I came home and found my best friend's car parked in my driveway. So I got my gun. You understand that. Consider the amount of information the computer has to have in order to understand that paragraph. About human behavior, 
sexual mores, expectations. We're not going to put that into a computer anytime in decades. That's just too much stuff. Um, so we have to use small languages, tiny languages, little bitty guys. And uh, I have spent years looking at all sorts of possibilities. There are a million of them. Uh, how many of you recognize the word conlang? Uh, it's a, a compression of constructed language. You know how every programmer likes to build his own programming language? Every linguist wants to build his own natural language. And these are called conlangs, and you can look them up on the web, and there are millions of them. And I mean, people started doing this 400 years ago. So, definitely conlangs are popular and there are conlangs for everything and each one has this special capability just like programming languages they're programming languages that are good for handling lists and artificial intelligence and mathematical calculations and on and on and on <laughs> but uh the main conlang uh, or well looking over these uh looking for a reduced one a small one basically i haven't found anything that was appropriate for interactive storytelling i'm going to ask you to wait for a minute because i just got a book for something that might be appropriate let me go get it Okay. The name of the book, is, or the name of the language is Tokipona. Uh, I'll write it down here just so you have it. Uh, you really don't need to get the book. It is, uh, everything that's in the book is available on the web. So you can search this. What is interesting about this conlang is that the author wanted to make a minimalist language. Uh, she wanted something with just 120 words. And in order to do so, she had to uh, come up with fundamental concepts that can be stretched to cover everything. Think in terms of a taxonomy. You know how taxonomy is, is basically a big tree. For example, we have animal, and then that spreads out into reptile, bird, mammal, amphibian, insect. And then mammal breaks down into canids, felids, uh, primates, uh, rod rodents, and so forth. And primates breaks down into simians, and oh, I forget there's another one in there and uh, then then the hominids and then hominids breaks down into uh, Australopithecus and those guys and then down further is Homo neanderthalus, uh, Homo sapiens and so forth. So a taxonomy is a big tree. Think of a language as a whole bunch of words and then you can build a taxonomy upwards. For example, you have the uh, taxonomy, you have colors, red, blue, green, so forth. And then there's a word called color that, in, that has all of those beneath it. And uh, then we can go above that to a higher level, you know, visual attribute, 
uh, well, she, she asked, how high can I go, or must I go to get to just 120 words? And she came up with a pretty good system. Um, it is, in some places, it can be very vague. Uh, but it is, uh, it is one way to do it. I'll show you another way that I never really followed through on. There we go. Thesaurus. This is a, you know, you've used it many times. This has basically about a thousand fundamental categories of words. And so, Theoretically, you could build a language using just the, the headings of these fundamental categories. I spent a lot of time trying to do something like that. <clears throat> I'm never satisfied with the results. Uh, I, I think it can be made to work eventually. It's just I didn't see the answer. So if you want to go off into the wild blue yonder and do some research on a minimalist language that might prove interesting, you might start with uh, Roger's thesaurus. There's some other th thesauri, but Roger's is generally the best. Although if you do follow this, you might want to look at some of the other uh, types of thesauri. Um, anyway, my solution was something called dicto. And it's really a meta language. It is a system for creating a custom language, a language customized for a particular story world. And uh, the, it is also, the Dicto is meant to be a computable system. That is, you can actually write code that implements it. An awful lot of, for example, the way Tokipona is designed. I, uh, there are going to be some serious problems using it in a computer program because it, an awful lot of its expressions are actually compound words. Um, that is, it, uh, uh, it has a word for hard object, and that can be anything from a grain of sand to a gigantic truck or an asteroid for that matter. And uh, and so they try to get more specificity by tacking adjectives onto uh, a word. So they can talk about a hard object that's round. Well, it's a ball. So anyway, it's I'm not sure if Tokipona is computable, but uh, I'm still reading the book and thinking about it. Uh, oh, name of the author and the book, please. Oh, oh, no, the thesaurus. Oh, no, no, no. Uh, it's just called Roger's Thesaurus. And uh, he did this, God, 150, 200 years ago, I think. Goes way back. And it has been modified over the years. Um, uh, so it no longer has many words about horses and saddles and so forth. Um, so, yeah, I don't, I, I briefly looked at some of the other thesauri, but never really, uh, never saw much in them. Uh, the deep dose system then is a complicated system. It developed over many years. And uh, I think it's uh, a very good system if you want to do language, a minimalist language on a computer. I think the Dicto system is the best we've got right now for this particular class of problem. Um, but I point out some of the limitations of the Dicto system. And again, I will caution you, as always, as I have many times, uh, if you approach, if you think about using Dicto, don't think in terms of expanding it. Uh, it's already too complicated. So uh, anyway, any last questions? 
Yes, go ahead, uh, uh, Sean. I've noticed here in the screenshots, you have sort of a, a line and then you have another line pointing towards something. Why did you not choose to take that and put it like inside the verb bubble to keep everything on one line? Does oh, oh, wait, uh, you mean, are you asking why is, are these, some of these sentences two lines high? Yeah, so I was just thinking, why couldn't you take the details and put them inside the verb bubble? Does that make sense? Um, I don't know what you mean by, by the verb bubble. Oh, are you talking about the speech bubble? Yeah. Uh, uh, well, so you've got like the subject icon, the verb icon, and the object icon, right? Mm -hmm. So instead of uh, having a bunch of details point towards the, the verb, couldn't you just take them and put them inside the verb? So it's all just like one clear sentence? Are you, so you're saying ex, the verb is in a square. Are you saying expand the square in yeah. order to Yeah, I think that would, might make it clearer. I, I would wrong. disagree on that point in that it's useful to have uh, discrete icons representing discrete words. So I think we clearly want to say, here's this word, here's this word, here's that word. Uh, in terms of screen space, uh, you know, they, we're not wasting much. Uh, so I don't, I don't understand why, what benefit, maybe you should tell me, uh, what benefit do you see in, in uh, merging the graphic images? Well, I just think if the player is looking at it, it can, it, you can sort of like, you say, okay, so this person said this, and then you sort of have to follow it along and go to the next line, and then this goes there, and then that goes somewhere else. But if you take all the details about the verb, like they say this is this much, and you take all that and you put it inside the verb, then they know the subject did this, this much, to mm. this person, if that makes sense. Oh. Uh. Well, I don't see that as, uh, uh, I mean, it can work. It's not inferior. I don't see it as better. Um, mm -hmm. I think one benefit of the system is the set of little arrows, uh, those tiny arrows that help guide the eye through the sentence. Um, uh, you know, they show, <laughs> which word is connected to which other word. That, by the way, is a serious problem in almost every other language. This is a two-dimensional language, and you know, two dimensions are a hell of a lot better than one. A uh, big problem in many languages is uh, references or referrals, that is, uh, uh, I, I decided that the boy who had uh, left school too early was unacceptable. So I decided that the boy was unacceptable, but I had to jump up to there because I have this stuff in between. And this can get, uh, most of us are very good at doing it clearly, but boy, there are some situations where these reference are so distant from the, uh, uh, from the original uh, source that it, the sentence can be very confusing. Mark Twain had a beautiful example of this in his wonderful essay, The Awful German Language. You might want to read that sometime. I think it's in the novel Innocence Abroad, and it's an appendix. And he talks about how stupid the German language is. It just doesn't work like English, you know? And uh, he... Uh, he gives it a, a, uh, a sentence. German does like to have long sentences. And he starts off, the beautiful maiden who did this and did that, goes on and on and on, comma, fainted. And uh, that's, that's the, the sentence. Uh, and he points out that that, as an example of just too much separation, between source and reference. So 
Anyway, the two-dimensional nature of Dicto uh, really undercuts that. Uh, you just don't have that problem anymore. I am now working on an extension to the design that makes it more complicated to permit clauses uh, as separate uh, uh, references within a sentence. So uh, I'll do that when I finish the million other things I have to do. So uh, finally, a report on the MDA project. Yvonne has begun working on the code. And in fact, yesterday he sent me something to uh, some data to look at. I mean, he's moving very quickly. I have, uh, I did a lot of work last week just on the artwork for it. I had to take all sorts of images and just put them through a standard thing. But I now have, and I also decided to reduce the number of characters. I did a few calculations. Uh, you know, if we get this many people, then, uh, and this many characters, well, how will that affect the statistical results? And just just plugging in random numbers. And from that, I came to the conclusion that I really don't want to have 100 characters. Uh, so I pared it down to 62 characters. And there were also only six movies or TV shows that I uh, allowed. I, ended, I had a lot of them earlier, but... Uh, I ended up stripping them out. And so in fact, uh, you can see the result. It's actually in the same place as before, but I'll give you that uh, URL right now showing the latest version. And there it is. Any last questions? Okay, then. Well, I will see you guys next week. All right. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.